my name is Banks Warden, and I'm the uh, executive director of the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Institute here at the Hutch. Uh, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight, and uh, it's our pleasure to have you join us. The flu pandemic has been in the news a great deal, uh, as, and this much media coverage is bound to lead to many questions. How serious is the pandemic? What can a community do to minimize the impact? And what can I do to protect myself and my family? Fortunately, for all the centers uh, for all of us, the Centers Vaccine and Infectious Disease Institute is the home to several world-renowned scientists uh, who we're going to hear from tonight. We'll look at the pandemic from a number of perspectives at the 40,000 foot level with understanding how pandemics spread, how we project their spread, and what can be done to control that spread. We'll then provide information on what's being done locally and what you can do to minimize your chances of being uh, negatively affected by the flu. Each of our two presenters will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll open up the floor to you for questions. During the question and answer period, we'll touch on the roles vaccines play in controlling pandemics and protecting our health. Our first presenter is Dr. Corey Casper. Dr. Casper is currently an associate professor of medicine and an adjunct associate professor of epidemiology and global health at the University of Washington. He's an assistant member here at the Hutch. Dr. Casper divides his time between research, teaching, and clinical care. At the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, he directs the infection control program, which has developed novel methods for the prevention of respiratory virus infections among patients with impaired immunity and new methods for tracking and reducing healthcare associated infections. I might digress here a little bit and say that Corey has set the bar for the rest of the cancer centers in the United States and the rest of the world by a lot. So we're very fortunate to have uh, his thinking here at Touch. He also directs the Uganda program. This program is in partnership with the Uganda Cancer Institute in Kampala, Uganda conducts research aimed at identifying how infections which cause cancer are acquired, defining strategies for treatment and prevention of infection-related cancer, and also has put together a training program for African and U.S. healthcare providers so that they can better provide good health care for the next generation of folks with cancer. In Seattle, Dr. Casper cares for patients at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and Harborview where he specializes in infection, uh, treating infections among persons with impaired immunity, such as those with HIV and cancer. Court. Great, thank you Banks, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for uh, your patience with our technical glitches. I have a lot of information to get through in 20 minutes, but my goal uh, by the end of today is to make you all experts in influenza, uh, which I think we'll be able to do without any problems. So uh, the title of the talk is What's New with the Flu? Uh, oops, sorry, one more technical glitch. Uh, what's New with the Flu? Uh, and what we will talk about today uh, by way of a basic outline is uh, I will tell you a little bit about the virology of this virus so that you understand specifically uh, issues related to how it can affect you, not to sort of bore you with virology. We'll talk about the transmission of this virus, uh, prevention of acquisition and treatment, uh, if all of that else fails. And then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, epidemics with influenza, both historical as well as the one that we are currently in the midst of. And finally, I'll give you some very concrete recommendations for how you can prepare for influenza this season. So uh, I think I'd like to start at the beginning, and it's always best to start with your ABCs. Uh, and so starting with your ABCs, uh, it's important to recognize that there are three different strains of influenza. So influenza A is the strain that you will hear most about because it is the strain that leads to the development of pandemics. Uh, influenza B is a milder illness, although we do see quite a bit of it here in Seattle, either in the immunocompromised patient or in children. And influenza C is not really worth talking about because it's not at this point a disease in humans. But one thing to point out is that tropism for animals. And so uh, influenza A actually can infect animals as well as humans, and it's thought that this is one of the ways that the virus generates some of the diversity, which it then subsequently allows it to wreak havoc uh, in human populations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, 
Uh, this is a stylized and pretty picture of the influenza virus, uh, and the reason I'm introducing you to this virus is because each of these elements on this picture have direct ramifications for how we treat and prevent influenza. So first you'll notice that there are a series of proteins on the outer surface of the influenza virus. Uh, the first one that you see here is something called hemagglutinin. Uh, this, this protein is important in the attachment of the virus to your cell surface. It, <clears throat> it governs which type of cells in your body will be infected and also gives it a species specific specificity. There are 16 different type, subtypes of hemagglutinin, and based on those subtypes, uh, those are really what your immune system mounts an, uh, an immune response against. So as those subtypes change from season to season, your immunity either is stronger or weaker, depending on its, its recognition of that strain. Similarly, the neuraminidase protein on the surface of the, of the virus also uh, is something to which your immune system can direct its, its, uh, its antibodies to. There's nine different subtypes of the neuraminidase, uh, and that is how the virus releases itself from your cells once it's, uh, once it's infecting it. Uh, the virus is an RNA virus that has several genes within it, and those genes are very simple, but they dictate how the virus makes more of itself and how it does what it does. Um, and finally, there's this thing called the M2 protein. It's a little pore that lets ion channels uh, from the outside world into this uh, virus, and what that essentially allows it to do is once it enters your cell, it allows it to get rid of its outer capsule uh, introduce its genetic material to your cell so your cell can make more of it. And all of these have ramifications for uh, either treatment or prevention. The drugs that we have that target uh, influenza are called neuraminidase inhibitors, our most effective class of drugs, and they work against the neuraminidase protein. Uh, similarly, the older drugs, which are now becoming new again, work against this M2 pore. And, fi and finally, the hemagglutinin is very important in developing vaccines. So these are all very relevant. Um, I will just say a little bit about how this virus is, changes uh, from time to time. Uh, I'm the parent of a five-year-old, and it was my goal when I made my five-year-old to have her not be a mutant uh, and to make sure that my wife and my DNA were passed from uh, each of us uh, to her. Uh, uh, influenza is a lot less selective. Uh, its goal is uh, not so much to care whether or not it's progeny or mutants, but rather that there's a lot of them. And so uh, the virus replicates hundreds of thousands of times a day, and each 10,000 times it, rec it replicates, it makes a mistake. Uh, it's not so caring about those mistakes, and if those mistakes are minor, they can lead the virus to sort of uh, change slightly, and what's called antigenic drift causes the virus to change just enough that it causes your immune system to not completely recognize it. However, from year to year, you can get profound changes uh, in the influenza virus, and when these pro profound changes occur, you can get something called antigenic drift, and this is uh, pictorialized here in the cartoon. But when the virus drifts this significantly, it is unlikely that there is much pre-existing immunity in the community, and this virus can spread wildly, leading to pandemics. So both of these can occur uh, in any given season, and uh, the extent to which they occur is what uh, sets you up for either a good or a bad year in terms of influenza. It's also the reason why each year you need to get an influenza vaccine, because the virus changes from year to year enough that there's not enough immunologic memory to combat it. So let's talk a little bit about how you get this virus. So the virus is thought to be spread by respiratory droplets, and not to get too gross, but the virus essentially uh, needs a ride, uh, and it needs a ride on the droplets that are produced in your upper airway. So uh, when the virus is produced in the cells of your upper airway, it hitches a ride on one of these droplets and exits your, uh, your nose or mouth. Uh, but the reason I'm going through this is because there actually are physical properties to these drops, such that the drops can sink. And so you may have heard that social distancing or staying within uh, more than six feet from people with influenza is an effective way to prevent yourself from getting it. And the reason for that is because, again, the, the physics of this particle are such that this respiratory droplet falls to the ground generally within six feet. And yes, it varies with how tall you are and maybe how forceful you eject the respiratory droplet. But in general, that's one of the things that governs how, how this, this virus gets around. At the same time, because of the characteristics of the virus, it doesn't persist for very long periods of time on environmental surfaces. And so again, uh, although you can get it from touching surfaces that other people have touched, that depends a little bit on the surface and a little bit on the characteristics of the ambient uh, conditions. But in general, this is a virus which is spread through close contact of individuals. Um, some of the clinical features of influenza, it's important to recognize that generally this is a seven-day illness. 
Now this varies, but it doesn't vary that much. Uh, there's a, obviously a distribution of severity and duration of symptoms, but not that much variability. And what's interesting is that uh, after being exposed to someone with influenza, there's a 48-hour incubation period. The second 24 of those 48 hours, you uh, will become symptomatic. But the first of the 24 hours, you may not be symptomatic, and you may still be able to spread this virus to others. For those of us who work on preventing infections in healthcare settings, that's a bit of a frightening time period because you have people who are asymptomatic but are still at risk of transmitting the virus. Um, however, that's the shortest period of the uh, duration of, uh, of the influenza illness. And in general, when healthy people with a, with a competent immune system uh, feel better, they generally stop shedding the virus and are not uh, transmissible, are not uh, uh, communicable. So uh, again, this is kind of the life cycle of the, of the virus within uh, the human host. It's important to recognize, I think, uh, so when, we, when, uh, when this year's uh, influenza pandemic came about, there was a lot of press about its severity and the clinical manifestations, uh, that it, the toll that it exerted on different populations. But it's important to remember that influenza is a, uh, quite a deadly pathogen, uh, and it's a deadly pathogen even in years in which there's not a novel uh, pandemic. So generally, uh, every, uh, every year there's up to half a million deaths from influenza worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., maybe about 36,000 deaths and about 200,000 hospitalizations every year, and this is without a pandemic. Uh, incredibly costly with close to $38 uh, billion in costs to the U.S. healthcare system. And again, uh, it can lead to these threats uh, of these pandemics. Uh, probably the most uh, uh, well-known pandemic up to now has been the 1918 pandemic, where again, it was thought that close to a third of the world's population was infected. There were a huge number of deaths, over 40 million, uh, again, half a million in the United States alone. So this, I think, puts influenza in a context to say that both in pandemic years and even in normal years, uh, this virus is a virus that should be uh, treated with respect, but certainly, I think, in these years uh, with pandemics, uh, we need to think about it a little bit more. Uh, this slide, I think, uh, essentially, if you look at the difference in these curves between the lower bars and the top of the bars with the gray shading in between, it's thought that that proportion of deaths in any given season were attributable uh, to influenza. And you can see that when you put that on top of underlying illnesses like diabetes, cirrhosis, tuberculosis, or rheumatic diseases, uh, or rheumatic diseases of the, of the heart, uh, you can see that there really is, a, at least in 1957, there was a significant increase in death, which is exerted in susceptible populations with this virus. So uh, given that it's probably something you don't want, um, how can you prevent yourself from getting it? And I would su submit to you that there's four ways that you can prevent yourself from getting this virus. Uh, one is to get vaccinated. Uh, the second is to perhaps wear masks, and we'll talk about that. The third is to use hand hygiene, which is essentially to wash your hands. And the fourth is to keep your distance from people who are sick. So these are relatively simple, but I just want to sort of go through what the evidence is that these uh, techniques actually work uh, and that there's something you probably want to adopt. So first, let's start with, uh, in, with uh, vaccination. So the first thing that most people don't realize is that, unfortunately, we're dealing with a somewhat antiquated vaccine production system when it comes to uh, flu. Now, one of the most common reasons that I hear people not getting a flu vaccine is because they say, oh, I got the flu vaccine and I still got the flu. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is obviously that there's a lot of different respiratory viruses that cause flu-like symptoms, and the flu vaccine only prevents against influenza. But on top of that, in any given year, public health authorities have to make a guess in February as to what strain of the virus will be circulating that next winter. So it's almost nine months in advance that they have to make that guess. And the reason is, is because it essentially takes nine months to make enough vaccine stock to supply it for the population. Now, if you think back to this past February, H1N1, or the pandemic influenza, wasn't even identified at that time. So people are asking, well, why isn't the H1N1 in this year's seasonal flu vaccine? The reason is because that outbreak started in April, and the vaccines were already in production at that point. So it's a somewhat antiquated system, but nonetheless, it's the best we have. The vaccines are made in eggs, and we need hundreds of millions of eggs to produce this. It's also why if you have an egg allergy, these vaccines are not recommended. But there's two vaccines you can choose. There's either a live uh, attenuated vaccine, which is called Flumist, or there's also a inactivated uh, a killed vaccine, which is given as a shot. Um, these vaccines can be made either with or without a preservative. Uh, it's called thimerosal, and it's a mercury-based preservative. This has led to a lot of uh, hand-wrangling in the press about whether or not it's safe. Uh, suffice it to say that the amount of mercury in the vaccine, even with the thimerosal, is less than in a can of tuna fish. But um, again, people have uh, been concerned about mercury exposure, and so this is something that may come up. 
Um, this year's seasonal flu vaccine uh, contains the following uh, three strains of influenza, because they can put three strains in the vaccine. And you can see that even though it has an H1N1-like virus, it offers very little protection against the pandemic H1N1 that's currently circulating. Um, in a good year, it's thought that the vaccine will present, prevent 70 to 90 percent uh, 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 of, uh, of symptomatic illnesses in healthy persons who are less than 65. It may be less good among elderly who are frail, but it still may be about 30 to 40 percent effective in preventing infection in that population. And then it may be even better in that population in preventing them from becoming hospitalized or dying. Um, there's a recent meta-analysis that calls this into question, but um, I guess what I would say is that it's not so easy, and I hate to be morbid, but it's not so easy to figure out what 80-year-olds die of, um, and so th these data can be bantered back and forth. But I think most of us think that the influenza vaccines, in years where there's a good match between the circulating strain and the strain in the vaccine, are very effective. Um, it's also worth pointing out in terms of the efficacy that a lot of people are asking whether the live uh, intranasal vaccine is better than the heat-killed and activated vaccine, and the answer is I think it depends. Uh, certainly for seasonal influenza, the live virus appears to be better in children, maybe those less than six years of age, but there's increasing data that the uh, heat-killed vaccine may be better in adults, the shot, uh, and there may be lots of reasons for that that we can get into later. Um, this study was a study that uh, literally was published last week in, uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The uh, table is complicated and probably difficult to read from where you're sitting. But the take-home points here are that this was a very interesting randomized trial that was conducted uh, in Japan. And essentially what they did was they took families where one member of the family contracted influenza and they randomized everyone else in that household to one of two interventions. One was that they gave them uh, instructions as to how to clean their hands more rigorously and the other intervention was that they both cleaned their hands more rigorously and the family members wore face masks, uh, not the sick patient. And what they found was that essentially both of these interventions were very effective in preventing uh, the acquisition of influenza from a close household contact when compared to doing nothing at all. So, or standard, whatever households would do. So using just uh, exquisite hand hygiene, uh, essentially washing your hands frequently before meals, before touching your nose and face, that reduced your risk of infection by about 54%. Uh, the combination of using uh, uh, extensive hand hygiene as well as wearing face masks reduced your risk of infection by about 66%. So uh, you may conclude from this that uh, if you have a family member or someone else that you know in the community who's sick, you want to both wash your hands and wear a face mask. I would sort of take that with a little bit of a, a grain of salt. Uh, I think that most of us here think that wearing face masks are not very effective to prevent acquisition. And I sort of laugh to myself when I see people on buses or airplanes wearing masks because I think that they're going to prevent themselves from getting influenza from the general population. I think this technique may work well when it's used in limited durations. Face masks can get saturated with snot, essentially, and they can then be vectors by which you touch them, and uh, they can be actually uh, increase your risk of infection. But more than that, I think, um, they work when you're in very close proximity with someone to someone else, but not so much when that other person is very far away. So I think that these are now some hard evidence to suggest that at least washing your hands and maybe the combination of washing your hands and using masks can help prevent you from getting influenza. Um, now, uh, so we've talked about vaccines. We talked a little bit about social distancing and the concept that it's good to keep away from people because of the travel velocities and properties of the virus. Uh, but if all else, and we talked about vaccines, so when you talk about all of those things uh, and you uh, all else have failed and you acquired uh, uh, influenza, what do you do? Well, the good news is that there is treatment for this uh, virus. Uh, at the moment, uh, the Centers for Disease Control has issued some very restrictive guidelines for who should be tested or treated for influenza. I'll just say that myself, I don't necessarily agree with these recommendations. I think that they're a little too strict, and I would offer, I would, I would say that uh, the guidelines for testing and treating should be more liberal. But nonetheless, there are essentially three classes or two and a half classes of medications that we can use to treat influenza. Uh, one is uh, one that has gotten a lot of press called oseltamivir or Tamiflu. Uh, Tamiflu is, a, is an excellent drug, uh, except when it's not. Uh, and so uh, when it's not, uh, was last season for influenza. And so last season, before we had the pandemic H1N1 strain, 99.6% uh, of seasonal H1N1 flu cases were resistant to Tamiflu. Uh, 
So I would suggest that in that case, that's not the best drug. Uh, on the other hand, the other strain of influenza A that was circulating, H3N2, was 100% susceptible to Tamiflu. Uh, and then the pandemic swine flu that we're seeing now, uh, we here in Seattle reported the first cases of resistance uh, to oseltamivir or Tamiflu uh, in the United States. Uh, but worldwide, there's about, uh, about a 0.6% resistance to Tamiflu, which I think most people expect will increase pretty dramatically. So uh, the point of that is to say that unfortunately, unless you know what strain of influenza you're infected with, it may not be safe to sort of assume that Tamiflu is a, is a, is a stopgap uh, stop measure for treatment. There's another drug uh, called Zanamivir, which is an inhaled uh, uh, a version of a neuraminidase inhibitor like Tamiflu. Uh, the problem with it is that it has one sort of, um, I don't know, I don't, uh, one fatal flaw, which is that it causes you to wheeze. Now, you can imagine that if you have a bad case of influenza, uh, the last thing you want is a drug that will cause you to wheeze. So unfortunately, many patients with influenza can't tolerate this inhaled medication, although there's an intravenous form that we uh, actually had to give under compassionate use here uh, at the Fred Hutchinson and seems to work well. But at this point, this drug is limited to uh, your ability to inhale it. And then finally, the older drugs, they're called adamantines as a class, but they're romantidine and amantidine, uh, used to have very little efficacy. And you can see that they're almost the mirror image of Tamiflu. So last year, uh, almost 100% of the seasonal flu was susceptible to romantidine, uh, but 100% of the H3N2 seasonal flu was resistant, and all of the swine flu was resistant. So uh, the point of this complicated slide is to say there are good medications, but one of the challenges for specialists now is to how to figure out which to use, when to use them, and whether combinations are of any efficacy. So moving along, um, I would say that uh, this is clearly something I don't recommend, uh, but uh, this is the year of the pig flu. Uh, and so let's now sort of zero down a little bit on, uh, on the uh, swine origin influenza or pandemic H1N1, as we're supposed to more properly call it. So first, let's say what's different about this. Well, there's a few things that are different. Uh, we think that it is more widespread. We think that it is probably more transmissible, and Ira will talk a little bit more about that in his uh, presentation. Um, we think that um, there may be some prior immunity in the older population, and I'll show you data for that. We think that the clinical disease may be more severe, and I think that uh, there may be some differences in terms of how we treat this in hospital settings, but I won't go through that today. Um, this is a snapshot uh, as of this evening uh, in terms of the World Health Organization's website, and I hope you can see this, uh, but essentially it shows that there are very few regions of the world that have been spared from pandemic H1N1. Those areas that are uh, in white, which are spared, uh, I would say probably haven't looked too hard, uh, but uh, all the areas that are pink have seen a case, and all the areas with a red dot have seen a death. Um, on the right, you'll see the cumulative total as of this evening. Uh, well, I think it was last tabulated on October 4th and the number of cases and deaths. So there's been close to 400,000 cases that have been reported, and this is just those that have been confirmed by laboratory testing across the world. And there's been, of those, about 452 deaths. So overall, I think you can see that, uh, that this is a virus with a widespread distribution and a death rate that's probably slightly higher than we would be used to seeing with seasonal flu. But that being said, there may be a bias in terms of the cases getting reported being the cases that are more severe. Uh, this is what things look like here in King County at home. Uh, and essentially, this is a complicated graph. But what it's meant to show is that the different colored bars represent different types of influenza, with the yellow bars meaning those that were never typed by the laboratory. So what you can see is that early, uh, if you look back here, uh, in the, uh, if, at, last, at the beginning of last season, so this is about last year this time, we saw that our, there was almost no influenza before October of last year. And then when, it, when influenza hit, it was c traditional seasonal H1N1 or uh, influenza B. But that starting in about May, shortly after these reports from Mexico, it was a complete shift to all of these cases uh, being the swine or pandemic H1N1. All of the yellow bars here were just not typed by the laboratory, but almost all studies that went back and found them uh, and typed them found them almost all to be swine flu. So here you can see where we are uh, this week, and you can see that there's been uh, essentially a 50-fold increase uh, in cases here in Seattle, uh, which is very early for the flu season for us. Um, so if you look uh, again at sort of what happened up to now in terms of cases and deaths, there were some interesting uh, demographic trends that were seen. So you can see that uh, if you looked at the number of cases, cases were most common in people under 24 years of age and very less common among people over the age of 50. But what you can unfortunately see is that although the younger folks were more likely to acquire uh, the infection, they were much less likely to die of it. 
And so this shows that death rates were highest in this middle age group, and then again, even higher uh, here than in the younger age groups. So this, I think, is where some of the data that suggests that one, there may be some pre-existing immunity to this virus. And indeed, studies that have gone back and looked at blood donors have found that about 50% of people born before 1957 per, per, have antibodies which are protective against swine flu. Um, which probably is why so few of them are getting infected. But unfortunately, these antibodies are not, 50% of the population doesn't have those antibodies, and it's not entirely clear that they're completely protective. So if you do get it, you may be more susceptible to illness uh, because you have other comorbid conditions. Um, the vaccine, uh, so there is now a vaccine that's available for the swine origin influenza. It's a separate vaccine for the reasons I've already elaborated. Uh, and it's been tested in about 40,000 people across the world. Uh, it's thought uh, to be quite safe. There's been no serious adverse events that have been happened in, in that group. There was some concern because in 1976, another version of swine flu caused a syndrome called Guillain-Barre. It was a neurologic disease. And the Institute of Medicine, uh, it took them uh, almost 30 years to come to this conclusion, but they did eventually conclude that there was probably an increased risk, uh, one, uh, an additional one per uh, case per million vaccinations. You know, uh, with an with a adverse event that is that rare, it will clearly be difficult to pick that up until large segments of the population become immunized. But for what we think as of right now, we think it's a very safe vaccine. And clearly, the risk of complications from influenza great, much outweighs the risk of uh, the possibility of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So... Uh, because there are such uh, challenges to making large amounts of this vaccine, uh, it will be rolled out sort of sequentially with about 6 million doses being introduced each week. Uh, and so to cover the entire population will take a little while. Uh, and so uh, the Center for Disease Control has recommended that there, this be rolled out to specific target populations in order, pregnant women first, and then women, people who care for uh, people who are at great risk of having, uh, acquiring the infection healthcare uh, personnel, uh, young persons who are, again, don't have pre-existing antibodies, uh, and then those who are older but have other medical conditions that would make it bad if they acquired this infection. So these are the target groups. Uh, the vaccine has arrived here in Seattle. Uh, it is now available at Safeway for healthcare workers as of today, uh, and it is also being uh, in introduced uh, slowly to other parts of the population, but the target priority for King County has been healthcare workers first. Um, so uh, I've come to pretty much the end of the 20 minutes that I had. Uh, I have a lot uh, of other issues that I'm sure people might want to talk about, and there's plenty of time for questions and answers. But to wrap this up in terms of take-home messages, um, I guess uh, I would put them to you this way, that the, it's pretty uh, likely that there will be widespread uh, swine origin influenza. And again, I think Iris' presentation will convince you of that. Um, I think that um, it will differ from seasonal influenza in that it may be more transmissible and it may be more severe in vulnerable persons. Um, um, there's some evidence that people born before 1957, at least half of them, have protective immunity, but that I do think that for everyone, vaccination appears to be a safe and effective way of preventing uh, both illness and death. Uh, I think that, that basically very simple strategies like washing your hands and staying six feet from other people who are sick will be very effective in preventing you from acquiring influenza, and that if all else fails and you do acquire influenza, I think that there are very effective treatments, but that expect to hear more about some of the complications of treatment, in turn, including antiviral resistance and nuances in terms of which drugs to use. The final set of take-home messages, again, for the workplace audience, I would say, is that for employers, I think that, uh, again, you'll hear more about this, but I think that if the models are correct, you should expect that a large proportion of your, of your workforce may actually be sick uh, this winter season or even starting now. And so I think that we are encouraging uh, employers to think about plans where uh, there's a lot of redundancy built in and where, uh, again, you may expect up to a third of your employees to be out. Um, at the same time, I think that um, we've encouraged our own institutions to be very liberal with sick policies because, again, the last thing you want is people coming to work sick because uh, then they basically will take down the rest of the workforce because of how transmissible this virus is. Um, so we've been, we've been encouraging things like telecommuting, uh, setting up uh, individual areas where sick people can work, uh, and other creative strategies. Uh, in terms of employees, I'd say don't come to work sick. Uh, get vaccinated. And again, I think it's important to plan ahead for things like child care and maybe limited access to materials and supplies if, uh, if it becomes more difficult to have uh, businesses up and running in, in the Seattle area. So uh, I think we'll take questions actually at the end, uh, but I hope that this has given you a little bit of an overview in terms of uh, influenza, its clinical manifestations, its virology, a little bit about how it's transmitted and what you can do to prevent all that. So thank you for your time.